to the stage. Thank you very much for, um, for having me. I'm Arno. I'm going to talk about making Python run. Um, I'm going to try, I have about a dozen slides. I'm going to try and make them as quick as possible. I have like a, uh, who am I, what am I doing, and uh, what I've been doing now, and where I want to go, like a theory section. I mean, we're in a school here, so I, if I'm lecturing, I, I can use that lingo, right? And then after that, I'm trying to get as much time for, for demos, so I have a way too much lined up for that. But um, so if you have something you want to ask, please ask me when I'm switching to the demo or any time between. Wave your hands and I'll try to repeat the question or maybe there's some people with microphones that can get it on the recording. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here, I'm from Zurich. I, um, I did all that schooling stuff and then at Google at 2008, I learned to do Python um, and I've been using Python ever since. Um, and so in my company, we we do some Python stuff um, uh, with a few people now, and um, we, we make, basically we help the other developers run their applications, Python applications, but also other applications um, in any infrastructure, in any cloud, basically, and with on-premises for those who aren't ready yet. So basically, uh, we're the firefighters. Um, exactly. Um, usually we try to build something like this, um, it's called like a software delivery pipeline, whoa, way management speak, right? Um, usually, well, we, 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 I mean, we use open source software, we tie together Jenkins and, and use GitHub or GitLab and use Python to tie them all together with webhooks and API calls and back and forth. Um, you know how it works, right? Um, and since we only do, you know, this part, um, it's getting easier, I'm not saying it's easy, but uh, yeah, and then of course we handle the operations part with all the monitoring and logging and getting metrics out and tracking latency and giving you access to uh, some ELK, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, where you can see the logs from all the servers and stuff. And then of course somebody has to do the on-call stuff, so uh, get up at night if something doesn't work and yeah, we can do that for you if you want to. And of course, give back the metrics to you guys or to the customer, whoever, um, so that you know you can do do stuff, make informed decisions. Um, I, I, I love Gal's um, speech, the, the keynote, right? I mean, uh, automate all the things. I mean, yep, absolutely agree. Um, before, when we were running, especially Python applications, we were taking virtual servers wherever, right? Cloud. Um, um, then we would manage the components, so the web uh, servers, the application servers, all that's needed for caching, curing, and stuff, uh, and manage that with Puppet and Ansible. Um, that's what we've been doing, that's what we know, that's what we use, and of course, trying to automate that process. Um, we, uh, we use Git, ta -ta, and uh, all our customers, of course, access to that Git, and so they can do pull requests and changes and stuff, and you always see what has happened and what has been changed and why, and that makes a lot of sense also from an operations point of view. And uh, it's like in the fire department, when you talk to, you know, firefighters, they tell you don't put the gas bottles or the gasoline next to the fire because we know that's bad. That's pretty much the same experience we're trying to give the developers back, right? Don't do that, um, or certain things. Um, but of course, um, we give them uh, uh, their own playground, like a virtual machine with Vagrant, um, to play around with. And that, of course, helps to, to test out stuff and to change versions of the application server and then see if it still works, or database servers, or whatever. And then you're at least a little bit more sure that it will work uh, in production as well. Um, so that's an example. Uh, this is going to be on the test. So uh, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> joking. It's a it's a customer runs Python. Uh, we just very high level. You don't have to read the text. You can zoom in on the slides when you're online. It's running on two cloud providers uh, with failover. They have like uh, load balancers. They have a, a web application firewall. They do financial data stuff. Um, then they have like Python application servers, uh, which we run with USGI. Um, then the they uh, put stuff in a queue, in a RabbitMQ, which then gets processed by the um, uh, salary uh, workers. Um, of course, they're all redundant, and they even have two versions of the whole stack running at the same time um, for redundancy and uh, um, different versions of their code. Um, and then they uh, do their stuff in, in, in um, Postgres and have uh, their files and all the other data on an NFS share now in this case, and then some auxiliary services. 
And you know, it's, it's a lot of moving parts, right? I mean, uh, even if it's automated, if you change something, you want to be pretty sure that it, you won't break all the stuff at the same time, right? I mean, that's nice with DevOps, one click and everything is dead. Um, but of course, it takes a lot of experience and um, we, we help our customers uh, do it for them, but it's very difficult for us still. We have to communicate, right? Which version of Python do you need? Is like, is like 261 okay? Or is 262? Or um, is it, uh, can we go to 3 already? Because, you know, 2 is end of life now, maybe, at some point. Um, so there's a lot of coordination, right? And we're nerds, we don't like to talk. Well, we do like to talk, but we don't, I mean, it's not unnecessary, right? I mean, that's something that could be like declared somewhere, right? Um, and in addition to that, I mean, scaling up and down servers, it's like starting a virtual machine. It takes like ages, right? Um, and then it has to be, you know, put, in, put into uh, Ansible. And I mean, uh, usually we do it for the customers because if it runs on the customer's uh, laptop, then when that guy is on vacation, it, it won't work. And that kind of stuff is, is pretty, yeah, it's not that flexible and not that fast. And what I meant with, it's, it's a lot of risk to change stuff. And so you only give it to the people with experience, and either they are not available, or they cost money, or both. Um, so that's that's kind of a problem, right? So um, in an ideal world, right, um, this there would there would be something that would so solve that problem, right? Um, you can hook it up to a CI system like we do now with with the other stuff. Um, you uh, it would handle all the the, the regular problems. We always invent reinvent the wheel, like uh, uh, deploying software. Do we do a git pull or do we like copy it to the server or do we copy it to a share which distributes to all the server or some other system? Um, you know that. That's a problem we've been really solving uh, for the last 10 years, every time again. And the same with like, do we do like red-green deployments? Do we do um, like rolling deployments? I mean, that's, that's stuff that's all been there for a while. And uh, we, yeah, I grew tired of doing it all over again. Um, so uh, we are an open source company. We have all our stuff on GitHub. So that should be open source as well. We want to improve it. We want to see how it works. We want to do pull requests. I mean. Um, but still, it's not something we can do ourselves, right? I mean, we can try, we have tried actually to write that ourselves and it, it, it doesn't make any sense and you only do it for a small subset of requirements and uh, that kind of sucks. Um, and for us, um, the, the path, platform as a service, services weren't an option because uh, a lot of our customers want to have it either in Switzerland or at a customer's location or that kind of stuff. So Heroku is kind of cool but it doesn't solve that problem, and it's not open source, so, ah, um, and API, duh. Um, I'm sorry, I'm very opinionated on that one. Um, <laughs> so, uh, a few years ago, now it's about five, four and a half years ago, uh, we started looking into Docker. Um, Docker as the first implementation of a, of a lightweight container runtime that was actually usable. Um, I mean, containers have been there for much longer, but it's been a pain to, to do them. And what it basically does, who knows Docker? Okay, who, who has used Docker, Docker build on the machine? Oh, actually, quite a few. Okay, I don't have to do that demo. Yes. Um, so basically, you take all the, the concept on a very high level is you take not only your code, but also the application server and all the libraries and modules and extensions and whatnot you have there. Uh, you put them all together at build time, and then you take that package and you can actually run it on your own laptop and test it out if it actually works how it should. And then you're pretty sure, or there's a lot less variables, let's put it this way, that when you run that same package on, on some other server or some other laptop, that it will actually probably run the same way. Right? There's a, it's, it's a lot, well, it's much easier than when you say, yeah, yeah, it should work with Python 2.7, right? Um, th that's a lot more variables there. Um, you have a Docker file, it's basically a text file um, that tells you how to build it. And since it's all written down in a parsable format, it's very easy to automate that, right? So we like that. You can put it in a, a Git Jenkins to do it or make some, something else do it and do, you don't have to do it yourself, right? And it helps you um, do your application or your yeah, application architecture or your system architecture in a way that follows the 12-factor app pattern. Who knows the 12-factor app pattern? Oh, shit. Okay. We're in school now. This is an assignment. Read this for next time, okay? 
Um, it's, I have a very, very small, you know, condensed form of this here. It's a management summary they have on their website. They have it in like a dozen different languages. So there's in German, French, and English, and so no excuses there. Um, it's uh, it's 12, pack, uh, 12 different um, patterns that basically tell you to use declarative formats for setup of automation. So um, don't make a script that does it, because when you, rip, you run the script the second time, it will fail because it's already there, right? Um, have a clean, portable contract with the online operating system. So, for example, a container could be one of those, right? It's a very easy and small one. Um, uh, should be able to deploy anywhere, especially in the cloud. Um, and you should use the same thing for both. You should eat your own dog food. You should use the same thing for development and for production and not have like, you're, you make your own testing system and then you give it to somebody else to do it in production because then you will know for sure that it won't be the same environment you're running your code in, right? So use the same tooling, use the same systems, use the same automation. And that, of course, then helps you to scale stuff up. And there's a lot of examples how you should do configuration with environment variables because they are easy to port and stuff. And read that, please. Thank you. But, you know, when you have a container that, that solves some of your problems, and that's actually what we learned four, four years ago with Docker, right? I mean, it's cool and stuff, and there's a lot of hype, of course, but it solves you a, a, a one problem. But if you want to do stuff in production, and now the firefighting comes in, um, there's a lot of unsolved problems. And since you can't read, I will read it out loud. There's the problem of security, code quality, container hosting, um, like discovery between different services, uh, scaling those services, uh, making local answer for those services, distributing the containers on different machines, right? That's all stuff that's, that's not solved yet by Docker, you know, the product or, or, or even the company. Well, they're starting to get there, but there's, there's been a lot of stuff doing, uh, work, happening in that space in the last two years. So what we felt was a, was a good tool to do that um, is Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is a... Con who knows Kubernetes? Oh, quite a few. You, okay, um, is a container orchestrator. So you do need to bring your own container, but then you can tell Kubernetes, so hey, here is the container, please run three of those and give me a local answer. So give me an IP and a port, and whenever I connect to that IP and port, you give me one of those, right? The closest one, the, the fastest one, the less loaded one, whatever, right? Just give me one of those. Or I have this bunch of servers and I have now all the containers I just gave you, please distribute them over there, make sure they can talk to each other, and you, I still have the local answers, right? So I don't, do, I don't have to care where they are, I just can connect to them, and that's cool, right? Um, or the whole deployment stuff, right? I mean, here's a new version of the container I gave you previously, please replace all the old one, but please make sure that you don't, you know, kill the application, right? Um, so that's, that's quite a lot of cool stuff. Um, it's a very complex product. It's, uh, I always put the, both the link to more information and the link to uh, the, the source code, uh, so you can have a look yourself. Uh, it's a very complex product. So basically, it gives you like a RESTful API, and you get like JSON documents out of it, and it's like, okay, I can't see shit. Um, but it, it, it has a cool technology. Of course, when I worked at Google, I saw a similar concept, so I may be biased, um, but since I don't work there anymore, I don't have to. So... Uh, here is the, the just a picture like a, you have like a like it, it, you give him a, a, a container. You tell him how many of those do you want to have, uh, and then it runs them on any available machine that you give him and makes your load balancer. And then when you have an application, you just connect to that load balancer and it makes sure that you get the the closest database or queue service or whatever you bring in that container. Basically, um, it it runs for you, and you only have to uh, manage the the what is in the container and not the how is it run and where is it run. And then you can open up like a, a, one of these local answers to the public and tell me, okay, this is, uh, um, this is like my public facing service, my web service, please make that available to the outside and requests come flowing in. And now, since I just told you that's very complicated to use, which is of course nice, but now there is something that uh, came along to, uh, sorry, Kubernetes is like four years old, and OpenShift is about two years old. Um, that's basically not much more than a web GUI, HTML5, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, a CLI client with an API, of course, they use the same API, which um, helps you, A, to manage it, 
because it has a web GUI, it's cool. Um, and it solves you the problem, like how do I get the application in the container in the first place, right? I mean, if you do it locally on your machine, that's all nice and good, and then you're on vacation, somebody has to change something, it's, they're going to have a bad time, right? Um, so it's much easier to just hook it up to your uh, Git uh, or uh, your continuous integration, since you all do unit testing, right? Um, and basically, whenever Jenkins is happy with your, with your release, it can uh, inform the, the API. Um, the API will also accept like directly from GitHub or GitLab the, uh, um, the web hooks requests, so it knows when to change something. Um, and well, basically takes the empty container, puts your code into it, uh, stores it locally, because it probably if you have a few copies of it running, you need to have it a few times, and then gives it to Kubernetes and tells him, hey, please deploy this new version, and uh, uh, here's the new version, and please make sure to not kill um, all the applications at the same time, right? So um, that was like the moment, um, like, okay, now that's actually usable, right? Um, because you have full control over the contents of the container, right? It's like just in logistics. If you can fit into a, you know, a container, a physical container, right? You can use the whole worldwide logistics pipeline. It doesn't matter if it's on a train or a truck or, or a ship or whatever, right? Um, you just ha you have to make sure it fits in the container. That's uh, the maximum weight and stuff. But uh, from then on, it's not your problem anymore. Um, so you don't have to tell your hosting provider or whoever that runs it for you which versions and which version of the libraries and blah, blah, blah to run it on. You just you put them together, and from them on, they're all, they're all together. Um, you have a, a GUI, CLI, API to do it with, and all, there's a lot of overhead stuff that somebody had to manage, either it was uh, the developer or it was the operations guys, that is the seamless deployment, SSL, load balancer, scaling, system updates, monitoring, backups, backups, um, hardware, storage, network, all, you know, all the cloud stuff um, that's being taken care of by the platform. And um, if, you do, if you don't want to take care of the Docker and Kubernetes and OpenShift internals, uh, as you will see, there's a lot of you know, sensible defaults in the platform so that uh, you don't have to. And also because it's already automated in there. So um, this is all open source. All the three stuff is open source. So feel free to play. They even have like a, um, there's an OpenShift has like this, uh, this binary, this program you can download as the, the CLI client. And if you have on your machine, you have a, like a, a Docker environment running, you do OC cluster up, and it starts the OpenShift in a Docker container on your machine, and then you can use the same platform on your laptop. And that's exactly what we wanted, right? It's easy to use and uh, portable. And uh, we provide that as a service in Switzerland or wherever you want in um, Amazon and stuff. So um, starting at 40 bucks a month for the Swiss uh, platform. Let me go over that. Um, if you want to have an account on that, just um, uh, register on the website, blah, 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 pause, blah, blah, blah. Um, we have a draw. I got budget for a draw. So if you want to have an account on that for a year for free, um, make a picture of this now because you won't see it later. And with that, I'm going to leave it up for a few seconds. And I'm going to start with the demos. If you have any questions now, wait. I'm not seeing any wavings. Very well. I think the draw will be on Monday, so you, the, I won't put, put it in the slides, and the videos won't be released until then, so you, only you, have the chance to win this. It's about, I think, a thousand Swiss francs or something, because it's... Yeah, sure. Yes. So the question was whether putting stuff in the container was difficult. Um, no, because actually we're going to do it right now. I have 10 minutes. Shit! Ah, panic, panic. Okay. Um, you need to wave more if you want to ask more, because I will be you know, watching here. You see that? Yeah, you see that. Cool. So you don't need the Docker build demo, because that you know already. But um, let me you know, just deploy some Python app. Um, so there's like a lot of ready-made stuff because it's open source. Everybody can contribute. So there's like from Jenkins to JBoss to Wildfly to PHP to Ruby to whatever, per Perl. Oh, go help God. Um, <laughs> but uh, of course, I'm taking Python. Um, 
let me call it Pi Summit, and I probably will fat finger this. Uh, me, of course, use Python. So, um, yeah, that was it actually, basically. Um, can you read that? Maybe make it a little bit bigger. So, um, I just created the Python app. I gave it the GitHub URL of where I have to source code. The GitHub URL will be in the slides, so that way you can go out check yourself. Um, it is now deploying in the background, um, and if I do want to enable that it does it automatically whenever I change to GitHub, uh, I can copy this URL. Go Since it knows it's on GitHub, it actually generates me the URL I have to go to, and uh, it's on the right place. It's very new. I have to change this to JSON. I figured that one out last night. Um, and I added a webhook, and then it should go, yay, it should be happy there. Um, then I go back to the site where I was before, and it says, yay, um, I can, it's built, and oh, it's already deploying. I can go check out the log, so download the Python source code from, the, from GitHub, uh, check that I have a requirements.txt uh, file in there, check, oh, you need six, okay, let's download that, um, and then made me a Docker image and uploaded it into the, the registry, you know, the pot that I had on the slide before, and that, that was it. Does it answer your question? No. Yes. Sure. So the, the, the question was refined to if it was more bigger and more complex, whether it was more difficult. Well, of course, it's more difficult, but it was pretty easy already. Now, of course, you have to have a look and what, what, where does it come from and what's the directory structure and whoa, and what did you do there? And oh, you're sim linking stuff in your repo. Don't do that. You know, yes, there's a lot of moving parts, but that's something you can do once and from then it should run by itself. Whew. Oh, it's responsive, of course. Uh, since I'm zoomed in so much. Um, I have to cheat and have a look. Um, so yeah, now I have it running here. It, it has one part, you see here. It auto-generated the URL for that, so that one should work. Yeah, cool. Um, I can uh, scale it up if I want to. Um, and as you see, it starts the containers in the background, and uh, as soon as they're ready, you see that this one is like pulling, and then it changes the status to running. Bam, and I have three, and I can open that, and um, it gives me another, there's like the, the name of the host, or the container, basically, right? It's the first deployment of the application, Pi Summit, and this one is the, the slug of the, um, basically, of the container. And if I go in here, I see, like, it started three containers, and then I can go in and check this one out. It runs on the server number 10, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't have any environment variables. I do have metrics. I'm not using a lot of RAM at the moment. I see the, the, the console output of the container. I can even, you know, SSH into the container and, you know, have a look and change stuff. Well, I, maybe I shouldn't do that. Um, and I can, of course, go back and check out the other one. And you see the other one was node 10. This one is on node 12. So if one node goes away, and then we have to talk to Dave, because this one is actually running on cloud scale, the cloud provider where Dave works. Um, so uh, we have to talk to them. But at least there's always a container running on, on some other host um, that should be working. OK. Um, I can actually check out, you see here that it's always, it's like, it's like just while loop checking out the thing. You see it's always the last thingy here is, is changing um, and you see you're getting load balanced actually there. Yep, sure. Yes. And that will be my, well, let me, not my next demo, but the demo after that actually. Um, so let me go in and I want to, you know, do some, do some f more fancy, more funny stuff. Like, for example, um, uh, I don't uh, like taking care of SSL. So I just click here and say, yeah, please do uh, SSL for me. Uh, I could bring my own certificate, but I don't care. I don't want to. Um, and for the, you see, it changed here to uh, HTTPS. And... Um, then when I click here, it's now, oh, it's, uh, it says sicher, which is secure for, uh, in German. Uh, and now it has SSL, and that was easy. Um, no more. We use um, Let's Encrypt internally if you have your own domain. And uh, we have a wildcard certificate for, the, for if you use the regular Puyo app uh, domain. But uh, yeah, we like Let's Encrypt. Yay. Um, 
let me change something else so that I can show you the um, uh, the uh, the platform functions. Oopla. I want to show you the automate all the things part, and I will show it to you with one container because it's easier, and then I will start a whole bunch of containers, and then you will be overwhelmed, but trust me that it actually would work. Um, I can do the same thing from the console. I will leave that one out, except that I will um, dump the configuration of, of this application that I just deployed um, to my laptop as a YAML file. Um, and then I can instantiate that um, again with the, with the template. So basically, you see stuff here? Oh, yeah. Well, it's not a lot you can see. Basically, everything I do in there in the web GUI, and of course, uh, manually, I can export as either um, YAML or um, JSON files. And YAML and JSON files have the great benefit that they're easy to, you know, change and manage and have five more minutes, yes. Um, and especially I can, um, I can ex uh, export the running application that I have as a template. Um, and then I can go and basically make the template um, uh, parameterizable. Is that a word in English? I don't know. So basically I can put in a parameter. And here I changed all the occurrence of uh, PySummit, the name I gave the application, with a variable, dollar $name. And then I told the template that, hey, um, there's a dollar $name variable, and please ask the user what he wants to have there, and the default is PySummit template. OK, so now I can go there and say, hey, everybody that comes along can um, go and instantiate that template. So I named the, uh, the name LOL, which is a very Good name to <coughs> name stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, as you can see now in the, in the web GUI, uh, it, it created the application, it's building, and um, as soon as it's built, it will be deployed as an application law. And when I go back and say, OK, uh, that was all Fallen Games, uh, uh, all app equals uh, law, I can also you know, get rid of me again. So that helps. Um, but um, especially what I can do is um, I can upload that template into this directory of, uh, of templates. And actually, there should be some my template here from yesterday. Um, so that uh, everybody in my team can deploy the application. And especially if it's an application with more than one container, uh, that makes it a lot easier. So let me take an example. So I have this Django PSQL uh, example. Uh, I could do some magic uh, configuration here, but I'm way too lazy for that, and I don't have time. Um, so um, that uh, consists of, and now it would be nice to zoom out again just to show it to you, consists of two services. Um, this is one is the old PySummit service, which you don't need right now, um, which has a Postgres SQL container. And here it's still building the Django part, and that will take about three minutes in this case. Um, we can go and watch and have a look at what it's doing here and downloading the unicorn and blah, blah, blah. Um, and now, of course, it's, it's an example and a demo application, but if you have a whole cluster of microservices, you can do a template, you instantiate the template, you could instantiate for each feature branch directly from Jenkins, you can give your team members access to that, and so everybody can you know, make their own test um, deployment of the software, um, which I think is pretty cool. And um, any other questions? Yeah, sure. How do I manage security? Absolutely. So the question was, um, when he played around with this by himself, it didn't work out um, because it says something about the container is running as root. That is absolutely correct. Um, always when running Docker applications in a multi-tenant environment, um, there's some security considerations. And one of the security considerations, and that's exactly the firefighting part, right, um, is to tell you don't run in the container, even though you could, you shouldn't run as root. Um, because you don't need to, basically. Um, just don't run on the port 80, for example, internally, um, but run on 8080 or whatever you want, 8000. Um, and then you may go and make uh, an application 
service, so that's the internal load balancer, which basically um, takes care of the uh, load balancing inside, which now here runs on 8080, and then only make an external load balancer run on the um, port 80 in this case, or uh, actually it's an HTTP load balancer, so the, eight, the load balancer takes the requests on port 80, so you don't have to. Any other questions? I already have the guys chasing me. <laughs> Out of time, uh, maybe one question and then we release you into the break. Yeah, maybe right here over there. So. Absolutely, and that's, you, that's what you should have read in 12-factor app, no. Um, <laughs> you have, um, you have a, uh, you can, for each container, you declare a path inside the container that could be a volume. And the volume is the concept of, hey, this part of the container should be persistent. And so all the other stuff in the container with have libraries and your code and stuff doesn't have to be persistent. Um, and then you attach like a, a volume to that container. And here you have like, a, let me zoom in again. You can uh, request the storage from the pool of storage. You tell it like a vroop. You tell it whether it is um, read, write, single user, read, write, share, or read only. And tell it I want vroop and you create it. And then you can attach that one, or you could actually usually do it over a template, right? Template requests the storage, and then it attaches the storage to that container, or that pool of containers, if it's multiple containers. And then you can put all your images and uh, user uploaded stuff that you don't want in the database in there. But of course, you should use some, you know, intelligent service to put your objects in there, which is called object storage. So there's a lot of S3 compatible. If you don't want to use S3 at Amazon or at other, other cloud providers, there's like Minio, which is like a container that provides you S3 compatible storage. It's open source, of course, as well. And then you can use the S3 connector, so you don't need the, all the um, mounting and concurrent file system access stuff. You just use it as an external service, which you have a load balancer to. All right, let's thank Arno for his insights. Yeah.